If you are that person, shout hallelujah. The Bible says, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now what that means is, at least in a day, there must be an evil. At least. And if there must be an evil in a day, somebody must become the victim of that evil. But you want to pray to God that the remaining days in this year, as you walk through the days, the Lord will preserve you from the evil of the day. Are you ready to pray that prayer? Lift up your hands to him and say, Father, I can hear you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, the remaining days in this year, as I walk through the days, and every member of my family, Father, preserve us from the evil of the days. In the name of Jesus, open your mouth and pray to him. We will not become victims. In the name of Jesus, we will walk in safety. Your shield will be sure around us. In the name of Jesus. We will walk through the remaining part of this year in safety. In the air, on the land, on the sea, everywhere we go, the protection of the Lord God Almighty will be around us. In the name of Jesus. We will not end this year weeping. We will not end this year with sorrow. In the name of Jesus. We will not end this year with sorrow. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We glorify your name. In Jesus' name we have prayed. And to every coin, there are two sides. If there are evils in the day, there must also be blessings in the day. You want to pray to God. That the blessings remaining in this end of the year, that as you walk through the days, the Lord will connect you with those blessings. Now lift your hands to him and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I receive grace today to connect with blessings remaining in this end of the year. In the name of Jesus, every day remaining in this last part of the year, Connect me with blessings in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and pray to Him. Connect me with blessings, oh God. Connect me with blessings. The glory of the latter is always greater than the former. Lord, we ask the latter blessings for the end of the year. Connect us with it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, precious Father. We glorify your name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. May I stand under God's authority to decree into your life that every day that you walk in, in this latter end of the year, you will not retire to your bed without blessings in the name of Jesus. When you go out empty in the morning, you will come back home full in the night in the name of Jesus. The ending of each day will be better for you than its beginning. In the mighty name of Jesus. And as surely as the Lord God of heaven lives, you and every member of your family, you will finish this year with joy. In the mighty name of Jesus. So shall it be. And in the service of this afternoon, the Lord will do something special in your life. In the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Somebody put your hands together for the Lord. Hallelujah. Now God bless you. May please have your seat. I quickly want to read the testimony because we won't have time to call out testifiers. I just want to quickly read this testimony to us. Uh, you remember that some weeks back uh, there was a service here uh, in which God said he was going to heal people with blood issues. And somebody sent in a testimony 
Uh, he said, the Lord healed my daughter. Her genotype changed from SS to AA. <laughs> Says, we have done two tests. Our Lady Gariki and Echo Scan Gariki to confirm this victory. May the name of the Lord be blessed now and forever. <laughs> Every one of us still waiting on God for the perfection of his word in our life. Before the expiration of this year, God will perform his word in your life in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, we told us that we'll be having this special meeting today. I know that um, many of us are used to the Wednesday, Wednesday meeting. But sometimes um, God does some things out of the usual in order to give the unusual to people. And I believe that today's service is one of, of such. Um, no wonder we have great men of God in the house this afternoon. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have my, my brother, my friend, all the way from Mombasa. He's the one coordinating the province in Mombasa. He's no longer a new person to us here. Please welcome with me Pastor Rotimi Davis, all the way from Kenya. You're welcome. Uh, we still have with us here, I, I guess it was around here yesterday. Meanwhile, I, I missed service yesterday. But I didn't miss too much because I also watched the video when I came back. Uh, pastor Petru Okebugu, the senior pastor of the ARC International, is also still here. God bless you, sir. We have also with us here uh, the pastor of Jesus' house, Abuja. Pastor Golade. Let's put our hands together for her. I mean, for him. I have with me here also, um, all the way from Ibadan, Pastor Lighton. God bless you. And all the way from the United States of America, the Faith United Ministries, we are honored to have in our midst this great servant of God. Pastor Bamidele Stodevant. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. Uh, I'm sure that we're still going to see more of him before he leaves Abuja this weekend. And um, I wouldn't know how many of us have ever felt disturbed uh, about the stigma that Nigerians receive abroad. You know, sometimes you just walk into a country and the moment you present your green passport, you are like the black sheep. And they want to separate you, you know. And um, they want to search you from head to toe. Because Nigerians, to them, are bad. But that's their testimony. Uh, we believe that um, if there's any race of people that is blessed above all, most blessed above all, is the Nigerian race. Well, some of us may not clap now because it doesn't look like that. I believe so much in the prophecy of our Father and the Lord that a time is coming that people will drop their nationality to become Nigerians. And that is coming to pass speedily. I'm telling you, uh, we're going to redefine the face of the globe. Because very soon when they are talking of people that are are important on the globe, Nigerians will top the list. And the way I'm looking at you, you are likely going to be one of them. Because I know I'm going to be one of them. There's one of us uh, that has made us proud. Uh, I mean, uh, when I heard what God has done through him and with him, I said to myself, the grace upon this man must rub off on us. I, I'm telling you, um, the other time when our father in the Lord, the general of Asir, was, you know, pronounced the most influential person in Africa, uh, all of us, we rejoiced. And daddy made a statement, I remember very well, he said, it's not for him that it's for us. And that very soon, some of us will begin to emerge as the best, you know, in the different places where we operate. Uh, many of us thought that that would take ages you know, to, to happen but we have another one that God has done for us recently one of us 
was voted the most influential black person in the United Kingdom. Now, you know what that means. The black skin is usually not celebrated in the UK. Usually not celebrated. But if we find one that is being celebrated, and I think one of the first 60 most influential black people on the face of the earth, and is our own. Somebody says something sometimes. He said we may be age mates, but we are not grace mates. We should understand that grace differs. Every man has his own level of grace. So the grace you are about to connect with this afternoon is the grace for prominence. Yeah. Let me tell your neighbor the grace for prominence. Yeah. All the way from Jesus House, London, it's my pleasure to invite our pastor, the most influential black person in the United Kingdom, Pastor Agu Iroku. Put your hands together for the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. You know, when I, whenever I'm introduced like that, I never fail to remember the story of the donkey. You know, Jesus was riding into Jerusalem, uh, the triumphal procession, and he was sitting on a donkey. And the donkey couldn't believe what was happening to him. Human beings were bowing to the donkey. They were tearing up, tearing down palm fronds and laying it on the road for the donkey. And the donkey had the time of his life. Human beings were taking off their clothes and putting it on the road for a donkey. The donkey forgot that it didn't have to do with him. That it was the person who was on him. So guess what happened to the donkey? When the donkey finally arrived at Jerusalem, that was the last we heard of the donkey. Since I don't want this to be the last you have heard of me, can we appreciate the one who really matters? Go on. Go on. Let's, let's bless him. Let's bless him. Let's bless him. He really matters. It's, it's not any one of us. It's our Savior, our Lord, our King, our Maker, our Waymaker. It's the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's the I am that I am, the only true and living God. It's your... here. Father, we just you. your name in this place. We declare that you are our savior, our redeemer, our rock, our shield, our fortress. We thank you for being our buckler. We just worship you in this place. You and you alone. We give you all the praise and all the glory for you are worthy, Lord Jesus. Without you, we are nothing. In you, we live, we move, and we have our being. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you. We are nothing without you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated in God's wonderful presence. I'd like to thank our pastor, Pastor Peter, uh, I, we have one connection who I have a high, a lot of regard for. He has a lot of regard for your pastor. He speaks so highly of him. And that person, when he says something, you can take it to the bank. And he said to me, he said, Agu, in Abuja, he said, this is one man of integrity. He said to me, what he says is what he means. What he means is what he says. And it is unfortunately not a common trait. So when we see it, we want to celebrate it. I want us to just appreciate 
uh, Pastor. I appreciate the integrity in him. Amen. Amen. And you know, um, one, of, one of my passions is, is marriage. I've spent 17 or 18 years teaching on it. Um, so much so that uh, recently, uh, one of the largest publishers in the UK um, has actually paid me to write about marriage. Um, and that's a lot of favor. You know, sometimes you write and you hope it sells, but when the publishers start to give you money to write, uh, that's a lot of favor. And that you people will be testifying about what God is doing in a similar way in your life by the time we finish. But, but why I said that was because I know when you see a man who's doing what he's doing, you can rest assured that his home is not like Afghanistan, is not like Iraq, that there's a peace and a stability in his home that allows him to launch out in the way that he did. Uh, they might not always be as celebrated, but a good wife who's holding things down is more important than any of the other things that we see. And so let's celebrate Pastor Kemi in this place. Let's just thank her for, for what she has done. Appreciate her. Amen. And then you may be seated. It's great, it's great to be here with my friend, Pastor Studivant. Um, easily the best preacher. If I have three of the top preachers in the world, he's, he's one of the three top preachers in the world. He preaches. In fact, if I wasn't secure, Pastor Peter, when I hear Pastor Studivant preach, I think, man, are we in the same thing? I mean, this guy can preach. But we thank God for different callings. I might not be able to preach like that, but just accept what I have to say to you. Hallelujah. Today we want to talk about, I, I, I greet all the other men of God, today we want to talk about the power of significance. We don't have much time, but I just want to share a few things with you. Um, let me preface that by saying a few things. Firstly, I don't believe anymore in coincidences. Uh, the word chance ceased to exist in my vocabulary a long time ago. I believe that God does order our footsteps. I believe that God is sitting in heaven and is organizing and orchestrating things on earth to work out his own plans and his own purposes. And so I am certain that God has arranged today. Uh, a few weeks ago, I didn't even know that I was going to be here. But somehow God has arranged it. So that we are here. I don't think it's just so that we can have a good time. And there's nothing wrong with a good time. I think it is because God is about to move something in someone's life. So that that person connects with God's plans and purposes for their lives. Amen. First thing I want to say. Second thing I want to say is that over the years I have come to find out that this Christian work is not as complicated as some have made it out to be. I found out that this Christian work has been made quite simple by God. If we are not getting the results, it's simply because we are not following the processes. I found out that this whole thing rests on principles. And if we follow the principles, then we get the results. Can someone say amen? Amen. And so today, I just want to share a few principles. We're talking about significance. Uh, uh, another word might be importance. Another word might be 
consequence, uh, someone of consequence, something of consequence. Another word might be import. We're just some, something that has weight, that has import. And let me just say that there is nothing commendable about insignificance. There is nothing commendable about dull. There is nothing commendable about dreary. There is nothing commendable about ordinary. We were designed by God to make a difference. There is no human being on the face of the earth that was born to be insignificant. If we find ourselves insignificant, then it is obvious that the enemy has used circumstances to trap us there. But I'm believing God, because signs and wonders must follow the preaching of the word, that if your pastor chose this title for our lunchtime fellowship, then I'm believing God that out of this gathering, we are going to hear testimonies from people who have moved from ordinary to extraordinary. It was never God's plan. When God created man originally, his instructions are clear and are full of import, of consequence, and of significance. The Bible says in Genesis 1 verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Now, dominion is not something that is related to insignificance. Someone who has dominion, or who has rule, as one translation says, is someone who's making a difference. And you and I were designed by God to have dominion, to have rule on behalf of God, but to exercise it here on earth. And then he goes on to say, so God blessed them, verse 28, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. These are not words that have any relationship with insignificance or irrelevance or mediocrity. These are words that carry with them significance. And my prayer for every single one of us is that as you enter this new season, it will be one of multiplication for you. It will be one of fruitfulness for you. And every barren area ends with the year 2011. 2012 will be your most significant year. And when you look at those who are significant, you find certain character traits in them. It doesn't matter who they are and in what area. There are certain things that are common to them. Because I wanted to make a mark in life, from a very young age, I was fascinated by autobiographies. I just wanted to read about great men. And then when I became a Christian, I now wanted to read about great Christian men and women. And I found as I read, and then as I read the Bible, that this thing is not rocket science. That there are just certain things that are common to these people who have made a mark. And I want to just share some of those things with you in the time that we have. And we don't have much time, so we will go very quickly. The first thing I found was that men and women who are significant could answer at any point in time the question that God asked Adam in Genesis the third chapter and the ninth verse. The Bible says, but the Lord called to the man, where are you? I found that people who are going places can always answer that question, where are you? I find that people who are not going places can't answer that question, where are you? Because if you can't answer the question, where are you? It means you're not, you haven't taken stock. 
It means you don't know where you are. And that tells me that you can't know where you're going to. For we must be able to answer the question, where are you? I'm constantly asking myself the question, where are you? I flew, I flew in this morning and planes are the best schools for me. I have a fantastic time on planes because I travel a lot. And on the plane, I took stock and I asked myself some questions about where I was. Now, some of the answers I was, I was not happy with because I was so far from where I thought I should be. But at least I knew where I was and I could now readjust the plan to help me to get to where I am going because I knew where I was. I take stock of my marriage at least twice a year where I sit down and, and I, in, a, in a detailed way I evaluate my marriage. I'm constantly checking myself spiritually to find out where I am. In developing myself personally, I'm asking myself the question, where I am? Because you can't even adjust the plan if you don't know where you are. And I find that most people just exist from day to day, rolling from one day into another. And people who do that are not going to go anywhere. They are just going to be carried along by whatever waves come in life. And so you must be able to answer that question. It was a question that God asked Adam. It wasn't a geographical question. Because God sees everything and God knew where Adam was. So it wasn't a where are you in terms of your location. It was a where are you in terms of your, where you should be spiritually. And so you must ask yourself that question. Where are you? Where are you in your finances? Where are you with your relationships? Where are you in your walk with God? Where are you in your business? You must be able to take stock. People who are going somewhere always know where they are. Can someone say amen? amen. The second thing that I find that is common to people who, who achieve significance is that they don't just know where they are, they know where they are going. I could, I could spend the rest of the session just talking about this. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says, Without a vision, the people perish. One translation says, Without a vision, the people cast off all restraint. And what is a vision? A vision is a divinely inspired mental picture. If God has not shown you something on your heart, if God has not painted a picture for you, it's not likely that you're going to achieve that thing. In Genesis, the 15th chapter, very interesting scripture. Abraham comes to God and says to God, verse 2, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliza of Damascus. And Abraham said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. How many know that that should be enough if, 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 if we follow theology? Because a word has come from God. And how many know that when you get a word from God, that's really what you're looking for. But because God will do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think, He doesn't just give you a word, He also gives you a picture. And so the Bible says, after He had given him a word, He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then He said to him, So shall your offspring be. Now it wasn't just the word. Because God knew, I have to help this man. I've given him a word, but let me paint a picture in his heart that will drive him to his destination. So God takes him outside. God shows him the stars in the sky. God says, can you count them? He says, no. God says, that's how your offspring is going to be. How many know that in the next 25 years as he waited, there would be mornings when he woke up and, and the word seemed far away. And he was just low. 
But that picture, he would remember that night. He would remember looking up at the stars in the sky. He would remember trying to count them. And suddenly faith would rise up again in him. Amen? May God paint a picture in your heart for where you're going. I said, may God paint a picture in your heart for where you're going. When I was told about your pastor, that's one of the things I was told. That the man has a vision and it's an incredible vision. That's why it would seem like he's achieving a lot because there's a picture in his heart. Amen? You know, Nelson Mandela, in his autobiography, A Long Walk to Freedom, he was asked what kept him sane 26 years in prison. How many know that's a whole load of years to spend in prison? 13 of those 26 years in solitary confinement. That means for 13 years, he saw, he did not see another human being. Apart from the guards who took him out. And they made sure they took him out when the other prisoners were back in their cells. Now, they asked him, how come you did not lose your mind? How come you came out so strong with a spirit of reconciliation and forgiveness. How come you didn't end up a bitter old man? He said something I would never forget. He said what kept him sane, particularly in those 13 years, was the picture of a free South Africa in his mind. The power of a vision. May God paint a picture on your heart. Number three, those who achieve significance have one thing in common. They understand time. Ephesians 5, 15 to 17 says, See that you walk circumspectly, as carefully, worthily, accurately. Not as fools, but as the wise redeeming the time one translation says taking advantage of every opportunity because the days are evil what does paul do paul divides the world into two kinds of people foolish people and wise people and what is the determinant of being a fool or being a wise person is the fact that one understands time understands the value of time understands that time is limited knows that they have so much to do in such a limited time and pursues with passion what they have to do because they know time is limited you know our church know that i don't do depression i don't do sadness i just don't do it and trust me i've been through some stuff that if normal people went through they'll be in a mental home but believe me, not once in, in all the stuff I've been through did anybody ever catch me depressed. And when people ask me, why don't you do depression or sadness? Why don't you do anxiety or worry? I don't do any of those things. I say to them, because the days I spend in depression or sadness or in anxiety or worry, heaven hasn't told me that they are going to add it back to my life. And unfortunately, the time that is left for me is too small for all these things that are in my mind the vision in my mind is so large that i'm looking at the time and i'm thinking to myself no time no time no time have to be at it at it at it does somebody understand what i'm saying and so anything that is going to steal my time is evil anything that's going to mess up my time is evil that's why I hate it when people don't appreciate my time. I went to a church. They kept me for one and a half hours before I preached. I got into the car. I told my wife, if that church sees my shadow on this side of eternity again, impossible. One and a half hours. I was just sitting down, biting my fingernails. If they knew they were going to be late for one and a half hours, they should have told me to come one and a half hours late. 
how many know one and a half hours I could have achieved a lot? A couple of chapters of the Bible. One and a half hours in prayer would, might have changed my life considerably. One and a half hours hanging out with my wife would have strengthened my marriage. One and a half hours talking to my children would have made them think I was a better father. One and a half hours sleeping would have allowed my body to regenerate itself. The psalmist says in Psalm 91 verse 12, Lord, teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You know, I'm fascinated, Pastor Peter, some people I talk to, I say, how was, how was work today? So, Pastor, it was lou lousy. I just spent the whole time waiting for the clock to wind down to closing time. I think you were waiting, you were just, just waiting for a clock? I'm fascinated. Just sitting now watching it from, from, from 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, closing time. Three whole hours doing nothing. My God, such a person must have more time than me. There's no time. In fact, looking at all of you, you're in your 30s, some 20s, some 40s, some 50s, some 60s. Even if God was gracious and we live to 100, you only have 40 years left. 40 years is nothing. You have 50 years left. 50 years is nothing. For what God wants to do with your life, May God help you to appreciate time. Amen. And it's not just appreciating time. It's also appreciating the timing of heaven. The saddest thing to see, Pastor Studivant, is someone who is trying to do something when that season has passed. Ah, your heart goes out to the person. You wish you had the power to wind back the clock. But unfortunately, you don't. Solomon understood that. He says in Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, verse 2, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. There is a time for everything. And you know, if you miss your timing, I'll tell you a story about missing your timing. This is a very personal story. About, and one or two of the people from Jesus' house are here. About 10, 12 years ago, I like stories. I like plots. I read a lot of Christian novels. I, like, I, I just love plots. That's why I like David's story. It's, just a, it's a blockbuster, David's story. You, the, the whole thing, you know, I don't know why people haven't written novels about it. Just reading that part of the Bible, I'm just excited. Just a blockbuster. Plot counter. Plot. Son wants to kill him. Son takes his wife, sleeps with her on the roof for the whole village to see. I mean, the thing is just crazy. The plots, but I love plots. So God gives me a lot of my messages as stories. And I, so when I preach, I can tell a whole story. Just tell a story. So about 12, 15 years, 12 years ago maybe, God gave me this story about this black man who came from Africa. It's actually called Ransom. I had a name for it, Ransom. Can you believe that? God gave me this story centered around slavery. Black man came to America generations later. The black man became the president of America. That, I mean, the whole story. It was like Obama's life. I preached it in church. Fantastic message. It was called Ransom. God said to me, write the book. Write the novel. Write the novel. I kept saying, I'll do it. You know, I, 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 told, I told a few people who were close to me. They said, Pastor, write the novel. I kept saying, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Guess what? One day I woke up and a black man was running to be president of America. If I could say Jack Robinson, the black man became president of America. Now, if I go and write the novel, what would they say? There's nothing original. You're copying something that you've seen. How many know if I'd written the novel, if no one had bought it then, how many know once a black man became president, everybody would have bought the novel? My financial problems would have been over. But I missed... I missed my season and it's the most painful thing because now I'm praying, still praying for my financial issues to be over. And God said, you missed that season and that window has closed. I'm praying there will be another one. And trust me, this time, I will not miss it. Can someone say amen? amen. May God never let you be out of season. 
Number four. Talking about season, incidentally, for a lot of the guys, uh, there's a season for you to marry. Yeah? A lot of guys, there's a season where it is marriage time. The women are different because they have to wait for you to come. But in our church, I tell them, I say, any man who's above 30 and is not in a steady relationship that's leading to marriage is irresponsible. Not to talk about 40. 40, what are you doing at 40? You're not married. You can't even get to where you're going because the Bible says you need help. God says, I make, I'll make Adam a helper. A helper means the person is bringing something that you don't have and you can't get to where you're going until help comes. So some of you guys, some of the guys, Pastor Peter, they come and trouble us. They say, Pastor, pray. My business, pray. I, I tell them, I say, your business does not, there's no devil troubling your business. You are the troubler of your business. Go and marry a wife. The Bible says she brings help and then favor comes upon you. You need favor and it's not from my prayers. Go and find a wife. And I also, I tell them in church. You know what I tell them in church? I say, I, I say to the guys in church, I say, and if... if because the guys sometimes they say to me, Pastor, I'm confused. I said, don't worry. I will find the wife for you. <laughs> oh, I tell them. I tell them in church. And we've done, found some, some fantastic marriages. I said, don't worry. I say, I'll pray. I'll fast. Then I will tell you, see sister so and so, go and talk to her. I say, if it goes wrong, come and blame me. I, I would have fasted for that thing. You just go because obviously you cannot see. And you're, you're seeing wrong. Because isn't it, interesting that, isn't it interesting that when God wanted to bring Adam's wife to him, God put him to sleep. Because the man would have confused the thing. He would have said, God, the hair is not long enough. Make it long. Then he said, God, 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 I don't like that shape. God, God, work harder. Make that. So God says, you are confused. You, you will be carnal. Your choices will be carnal. So just sleep. When I find her, I bring her to you. Number five, we don't have much time, let's go. Four, four, number four, diligence. This is one of the challenges of our Pentecostal faith. I believe in a miracle working God. I really do. But I've also searched the Bible and I found that in a very interesting way, God does his but says to you, you've got to do yours. Most of us will think that Solomon had it easy. One night he prayed, asking God for grace to do the work of rulership. God comes and God says, not only will I give you grace, I will give you money, I will give you fame, I will give you a blank check. But it's interesting that the, the person who wrote the most about diligence in the Bible was Solomon. And when you look at Solomon's life, you don't find the life of someone who was just lazing around. You find the life of one of the most astute managers that the Bible records. A man who set up complex taxation systems. A man who harnessed whole countries and brought them under his rulership with complex systems of gov governance. The systems were so complex that when his son took over, his son could not manage the complex systems. The nation broke up. So Solomon had favor, but Solomon was diligent. A lot of people are waiting for something magical. But Christianity is not magical. Proverbs 14 verse 23, in all labor, all hard work, there is profit, but the talk of the lips tended to penury. The talk of the lips. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. There's one, one gentleman I was counseling, he's just been in every kind of business. I mean, I've seen him in seven different businesses. I said to him, you are confused and unstable. In the time I've known you, God cannot be changing the vision with rapidity, the way you're bringing... You're in this one, you're in that. I say you are, you are double-minded and unstable. And you talk 
more than you do. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He will stand before kings and not before mean men. And what is diligence? Constant and steady application. Constant and steady. And the thing with diligence is that it's often lonely, it's often in obscurity, but the reward is always seen publicly. Diligence. When they sack people in offices, when they just sack randomly, bosses are not stupid. Everybody has a self-preservative instinct in them. If I know that this person is good for me, I'm not sacking that person. But when they just, just retrench everybody, they, because they think, they think everybody is a statistic. They say sack 1,000. They just put everybody inside the 1,000 because the, none of the 1,000 have distinguished themselves. They are just numbers. But if somebody has distinguished themselves by their diligence, believe me, somebody somewhere is going to get up and say, not because they love you, but because they want to protect themselves, they need somebody who will help them, they are going to say, exclude this person from this thing. Because somebody is diligent. And diligence takes from ordinary to extraordinary. How I many like football here? Okay. There's an English football player for Chelsea, which is my team, <laughs> called, called Frank Lampard. Yeah, how many know Frank Lampard? Okay. Now, Frank Lampard, believe me, I saw him from when he was 17. He's the most ordinary of players. He doesn't have the skill of a, of a, of a, of a Rooney, the skill of a Pelé. He doesn't have, he's not a skillful player. He's just a very ordinary player. But Frank Lampard now is the highest scoring midfield player in the history of English football. And how did that happen? How did an ordinary boy with no skills, you haven't seen Frank Lampard do anything on the field that makes you stand up and think, my God, that was a move. No, he just scores goals. How did he do that? Because when training stops at Chelsea and everybody goes off the field, Frank Lampard is still on the field practicing because he knows that I don't have the kind of skills they have. So I have to work harder. I have to be more diligent so that I can achieve the results. Am I making some sense to someone? Diligence. Diligence. There was a girl, one of my spiritual daughters, lovely girl. She's got a brilliant job in Paris. Fantastic job. I mean, this girl's young. She's only 29. I don't know what she's doing with that kind of money. But anyway, she's got a fantastic job with a French bank in Paris. Now, she went to school at the University of Lagos. And every time the university closed down, and in those days, the university closed, was more closed than open. Yeah. I mean, things are slightly better now. Those days, I mean, they were closed. Every time the university closed down, she went to Alliance Francaise and, and studied French. Her friends went and had parties. Some traveled abroad to work a bit and get some sterling or some dollars. She just went and sat, sat there. So by the time she finished school, a three-year degree took five years. By the time she finished school, she was totally proficient in French without leaving the shores. And so this French bank applied as, uh, uh, had a vacancy. She went for the interview. They whittled the interview down from hundreds of people. Eventually, three people. Their choice was between three people. They told her that the three people, that the th her and the other two people, in terms of skills and all that, they, had, they couldn't make up their minds. But they said to her, what clinched it for you was that as they were interviewing her, the lady was French. Somewhere in the middle of the interview, God just told her to switch that interview to French. She started speaking to the lady in French. The lady, was, the lady just moved all the interview papers aside. And just started talking to her about life, just intrigued with this girl who's never left Nigeria, who speaks such fluent French. That's how she got the job. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that she was just diligent. While others were partying, she was studying French. Now, she earns a salary when I heard her salary. I said, 29. What are you doing with that kind of... What do you do with the money? Seest thou a man diligent in his business... He will stand before kings and not before mean men. Amen? 
I could say a lot more, but let me just say one more thing. Got a, got a lot more I could say. Talk about perseverance, talk about the right attitude, but we don't have time. The lunchtime fellowship. Let me just say one more thing, and I'm done. When we talk about significance, we're not talking about significance in the eyes of man. Our audience is not here on earth. Our audience is in heaven. If man makes you significant, man can also make you insignificant. If you listen to the praise singers, the same people who said Hosanna, amazing, a week later were the same people who were saying kill him. And so you learn if you understand the kingdom that your audience is in heaven. And so you are constantly trying to please God. Because that's your audience. Why are you also constantly trying to do that? Because you also know, like the book of Zechariah records in the fourth chapter and the sixth verse, that it's not by power or by might, but it's by his spirit. You know that, yes, you can be diligent. Yes, you can work hard. Yes, you can choose the right relationships. But you know ultimately if God does not put a grace, an anointing, favor upon you, all your work is, is in vain. The psalmist says in Psalm 127 verse 1 that except the Lord builds the house, those that build labor in vain, except he watches the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And so we know that we present these things to God. God puts a grace and puts an anointing upon it. If we don't present it to God, there's nothing God can do. If we are waiting for God to come and be diligent for us, we will wait till eternity. But when we've done all the things we need to do, when we've got a vision, when we know where we are, when we have direction, when we have focus, when we surround ourselves with the right people, people who will mentor us, speak into our lives, encourage us. You know, I don't do relationships with people who are going to tell me it can't happen. Life is hard enough trying to believe it can. How many know faith is, faith is not easy? I'm always amazed when people think faith is easy. My whole body is telling me, my whole mind, my whole education, the whole world is telling me it can happen. It is only my quiet time that I'm trying to get it into my system that it can happen. I don't need anybody who's going to come and add to all the problems I have that are telling me it can happen. I need somebody who's going to say, with God all things are possible. And if there's one thing that has helped me in this work is the relationships I have. I, I value relationships. And I have some good relationships. And usually I say to people, show me your relationships. I can tell you where you'll be in 10 years' time. Just show me. Just tell me who mentors you. Because you can't be, you can't be much better than your mentor. Because you can't, what is given into you is what's going to make you. Show me your friends, those you surround yourself with. Just show me. Just give me a list of 10 of your relationships and I can tell you what you're going to become in life. Amen? Because those are the people who are feeding into your life. Those are the people who are praying for you, praying with you. Those are the people who surround you. And invariably, those are the people who are going to make you. Amen? Praise God. I'm praying that next year, if, because I believe that there have to be signs and wonders for the preaching of the word. I'm praying that next year, some of you are going to enter a level of prominence. Yeah. I'm believing God that every single person here is going to certainly move from where they are to the next level. As you do what you are supposed to do, you will see released upon you tremendous grace and favor to take you to the next level. Next year, 2012, is your year of significance. I, I said next year is your year of significance. 
Next year is your year of consequence. Next year is your year of import. Next year is the year that you multiply the results in your life. Next year is the year that you experience the favor of God like you've never experienced it. As long as your heart is kingdom minded, the king of the kingdom is going to come and take you to the next level. As long as it is prominence or significance not to consume on your lust, but as long as the primary aim is the advancement of the kingdom, you will see the hand of the king of the kingdom on your life. Father, we thank you and we bless you. Almighty and everlasting God, your word is never preached without signs and wonders following. And Father, this sign and wonder we're asking as we correct things, for there's obviously a correction that needs to be done. The sign we're asking, Father, is that for every single person under the sound of my voice, not one Heavenly Father, but for every single person, there are testimonies that there has been a movement in their lives. And Father, for those that you are going to accelerate the movement, we thank you for for some people will look back, Father, today, in a few weeks, in a few months, and they will marvel at what acceleration can do. We give you all the praise and glory. Give God a clap offering, God. Hallelujah. Wow. <laughs> you know what our advice we do? Make sure to get the DVD or the audio CD of this message. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing. If I were you, I would put it permanently in my car. As I run through the remaining days in this year, because you see, you don't have to wait till the first day of January to begin to prepare for greatness in the year 2012. If you are going to shift base in the year 2012, now is the time to begin to prepare for it. Hallelujah. Now, what we have heard this afternoon is just an appetizer. Uh, you will get to hear more um, tomorrow at the International Conference Center where Pastor Agu will still be speaking with us. Time is 4 p.m. If I were you, I would come in on time because uh, ICC won't take more than 5,000 people and I'm sure well over 10,000 will want to be in attendance. So if you don't want to stay outside, come in on time to have a seat there. These are real words that you don't come by every now and then. And... Um, when you have an opportunity to receive words like these, make the most of that opportunity. How many of us will be at the ICC tomorrow? You don't have any reason not to be there anyway, so that you don't miss the chance. Hallelujah. Um, by God's grace, God bless you, please be seated. We're running up, we'll soon be out of here. By God's grace, this evening, uh, you know, we normally do this towards the end of the year. Because while others are praying to God to finish the year strong, we are asking God to help us enter into the new year with a new vigor. We are already preparing for the year 2012. And that's why uh, by 6 this evening, we we'll still have with us here Pastor James Fadele. Uh, he should be in the air right now, all the way from Dallas in Texas. He's also coming to give us some, some talks on how to prepare for God's best in the year 2012. If I were you, I would be here 6 p.m. Uh, today. Uh, some of us know him. He's the chairman, board of coordinators of all our churches in the United States and in Canada. He's a man highly gifted by the Lord. Um, we have with us here, like we have introduced him, uh, Pastor Bamidele. I'm sure maybe he will tell us how he got that name, Bamidele, here. Uh, because when you see an American answering a Yoruba name, then 
it gets comma. Praise the Lord. And like I said to us, is a man anointed by God. You see, um, if I were to apply to have him here, maybe I would have waited for one year or more. But on the platter of grace, God brought him here for us. <laughs> you see what grace can do? There are people that are struggling to have him. And he's telling them, look, my itinerary is fully booked. But grace brought him. Yesterday I was on the plane with uh, Dr. Miles. And then when we're waiting for our luggage in Lagos, we're just chatting. We're like that for about 45 minutes. And I said, my goodness, Dr. Miles staying with you for 45 minutes, there are people that will pay him hundreds of thousands of dollars to have him for 45 minutes. But I was just with him and we're just talking. And I'm telling you what I learned in that 45 minutes, oh, check me out in the next five years. And come and see where I will be. So we have another grace in the house. And I've told him, um, requested that he should be here with us on Sunday to be a blessing to us. He will be ministering at the second service on Sunday. And um, I want to appreciate my brother and my friend, Pastor Gbalade, for making this happen. God bless you, sir. I appreciate him now. You know, there are helpers of destinies. There are people that you will need to get connected to where you are going. Without him, probably we won't have this privilege of having Pastor Sullivan with us here. Uh, it's now my pleasure to welcome, uh, I will remove the English name. Let me call him Pastor Bamidele to the podium. God bless you, sir. He will take the offering and then close us with benediction. Well, somebody shout hallelujah. That hallelujah was on one leg. Please shout a bigger hallelujah. Can't we appreciate Pastor Agu? Wasn't that awesome? Amen. Listen, let me just share one or two things with you as we take this offering. Um, there was an old man in a village. And everyone said concerning him that he was Mr. Know-it-all. They said he knows everything. Two little boys, young guys, they came up and they said, we are tired of this old man thinking that he knows everything. We're going to play a trick on him. They took a little bird, put it in their hand, and it was alive. And they put it behind their backs. And they said, we're going to ask the old man, old man, is the bird that I'm holding in my hand alive or dead? Said if the old man says the bird is alive, they're going to crush it and say, see, old man, you were wrong. The bird is dead. They said if the old man said the bird is dead, they were going to open their hand and let the bird fly out and say, see, old man, you were wrong. The bird is alive. So they put the bird in their hand behind their back and they walked up to him and they said, old man, is the bird I'm holding in my hand alive or is it dead? And the old man stroked his beard and he waited for a while and scratched his head. And he said, young man, the answer is in your hands. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24, it says, There is one who scatters, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, and it leads to poverty. When you sow this seed today, whether you reap sparingly or bountifully, the answer is, is in your hands. You can determine 
The size of your harvest by the size of your seed. It doesn't matter how much somebody prays over your seed. You must release the seed in order to get the harvest. I want to challenge every one of you in here today. I want you to determine the size of the return that you hope to receive by releasing what's in your hands. Let us pray. My Father and my God, here are your sons and your daughters. We trust you. Because you taught us in the concept of reciprocity, that while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer, winter, they will not cease. I pray, my Father and my God, that as these, your children, release this seed, let them receive the harvest. I pray, my Father and my God, that it will come twofold, one from you and then from people. You said you would open up a window that there would not be room enough to receive. But you said from people we could receive good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, that you had assigned men to give into our bosoms. I ask my Father and my God that even as your servant shared today, that the signs would follow this seed. Let there be a harvest that we are unable to receive. Not for us, but so that we can be an asset to your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. We're going to share the grace now, and then you'll just bring your, altar, your, your um, offering and you'll put it on the altar. Amen. And that way we can complete a few things at one time. Shall we share the grace? The grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, come on. The love of God, come on. Be with us now and forevermore, amen. Surely shall follow me. How long? Come on. In the house of the Lord, forever, amen. God bless each one of you.